Hi everyone, welcome to the show. I'm Dr. Nicole and today we're gonna to talk about a very important topic around ADHD, specifically non-medication treatment options for ADHD. In my 21 year career, I have watched the rates of ADD and ADHD skyrocket um, in children and teens and even in adults and the number of prescriptions that are written for those issues have skyrocketed as well and while medication may be an appropriate treatment intervention for some kids, I feel like we need to really look deeper at what it is that's going on that so many children and teenagers are being diagnosed and medicated for this condition. And to help us understand this better, I'm thrilled to have as my guest today, Dr. Sandy Newmark. Dr. Newmark is a physician and a clinical professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of California and the Director of Clinical Services at the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine. He's also the head of the Pediatric Integrative Neurodevelopmental Program at the Osher Center, specializing in the treatment of autism, ADHD, and other developmental or chronic childhood conditions. He has a longstanding interest and expertise in nutrition and its impact on childhood development and general health. He combines conventional medicine with nutrition, behavior management, and various complementary modalities. Dr. Newmark has lectured widely on both autism and ADHD, and has authored three chapters in integrative medicine textbooks. He has written a book entitled ADHD Without Drugs, A Guide to the Natural Care of Children with ADHD, and his UCTV talk on ADHD has had over 4.6 million views. Um, and I first read Dr. Newmark's ADHD um, Without Drugs book many years ago now and have referred back to it often in my work at the clinic with families and kids. Um, so it's such a pleasure to have him on the show. Welcome to the show, Dr. Newmark. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm curious, I, I want to dive into questions around why so many kids are being diagnosed with ADHD and you know non-medication treatments, but I'm just curious, in reading your bio, your, your expertise and your experience read similar to mine, and I'm curious how you um, first got interested in or involved um, in working with kids who have things like autism, ADHD, um, neurodevelopmental kinds of issues. Yeah, so I was doing general pediatrics and I became uh, interested in ADHD first because this was before the big autism uh, uh, explosion happened and but there are still a lot of kids with ADHD and <clears throat> I found as a pediatrician who was interested in development I just found it kind of fascinating uh, that seeing the increased number of children and trying to figure out what to do about them and then when I opened I opened a general pediatric integrative medicine practice uh, after my integrative medicine fellowship, where I saw just about everything that uh, would come through, but more and more kids came in with autism and ADHD and autism and ADHD, and it just uh, kind of became my specialty that way. That's great. And I think over the course of the last 10 to 20 years, we have just seen an explosion in um, the number of kids diagnosed with these things, or even if they're not diagnosed with autism or ADHD, having symptoms of things that are sort of on that neurodevelopmental kind of continuum. I know I've seen that in my practice as well. So Absolutely. I guess it begs the question to start out with, why do you think so many kids are being diagnosed with ADHD these days? Well, so to answer that question, you have to distinguish between kids who have ADHD and kids who are being diagnosed with ADHD, because mm -hmm. those are two tremendously different questions. And to back up and even a little more, you have to understand what ADHD really is. I mean, ADHD, the clinical definition is some combination of hyperactivity, inattention, and impulsivity that has an impact on your life at home and for kids at school. And so each one of those things is on a continuum. Like some people are very careful and some people are very impulsive and that's just normal. Some people are very active and some people are quiet and some people are really good at focusing and some people are not so good and that's all normal. Where ADHD is, is kind of at one end of the continuum where it gets to the point where it's past normal. It's, it's, it causes impact. But where that point is, is something that's very subjective. It depends on where you live and what school you go to and what your parents uh, are expecting. And because of, I think, our, our society and the, uh, and the demands on kids, 
a lot of kids who just would have been a kind of the normal one end of the spectrum now suddenly have ADHD or the continuum, because I don't want to confuse people that it's autistic spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, in kindergarten now, children are expected to learn to read and write. This never happened when I was in kindergarten, probably when you were in kindergarten. And so, yes, most kids can do it, but some kids aren't developmentally ready. And so now those kids, instead of just being normal kids, suddenly they can't learn to read and write. They're not that great at paying attention at five years old. And they get diagnosed with ADHD. One really interesting study showed that if you were born in August rather than September, you were more than twice as likely to be treated, uh, diagnosed with ADHD and treated with medication for ADHD. Why? Because you're the youngest kid in the class. And this has been shown in several studies. One study even showed all the way through junior high school, the youngest kids were 50% more likely to be diagnosed. Mm -hmm. So you have that. Then I also think there's um, a tremendous pressure in our society because of uh, uh, both parents working and so little time and kids you know, going to school, going to after school programs, getting home at six o'clock, everybody's tired, everybody's irritable, and now they're supposed to sit down and do homework. And for a lot of kids, you know, that's really difficult. And so what happens? They don't do their homework, their teacher starts complaining, they're tired, and again, the easiest um, thing is to diagnose ADHD. Mm -hmm. So there's also interesting uh, data that shows in counties where or places where teaching for the test is required, in other words, teachers' jobs are, are dependent on their kids' production, on their pupils' production, those places have significantly higher ADHD rates. Mm -hmm. So there's pressure on teachers to teach to the test, to have kids you know, do well on standardized testing. And if a kid is doing badly, wow, you can make them do better by giving them Ritalin or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that's another issue. Mm -hmm. I, it's so true, just the change in expectations um, for kids, even over the last 20 years. My, my first um, degree in profession was actually in teaching. Um, and you're absolutely right. How I was taught to teach kindergarten, first grade, second grade, now, you know, 25 years later, it's a totally different ball game. I mean, we were having kindergartners come to school for half days and they were getting, you know, downtime and playground time and the focus was around pretend play and developing communication skills. And now they're in school for a full day every day. They have very little time to play, um, to have recess, to spend time outdoors. And most of their time now is spent sitting at desks doing more of the academic subjects, as you mentioned, reading, writing, even social studies, you know, science, those kinds of things at that really early age. Yeah, yeah. I, I usually say the requirements when I was at kindergarten, people were eat, sleep, play. That's yeah. what you had to be able to do. It's a far cry from having to be able to sit there for hours doing academics. Right. And so what, what you're saying is that it's not so much that things have changed in terms of so many more kids with true intrinsic brain-based problems, but it's, it's more that the expectations, the way that the environment and our culture has shifted, it's become such a, a mismatch with where kids are developmentally at that age that it can make many kids look like they have more significant problems when actually it's just that it's not a good match for what's happening in the environment. Is that right? That's part of the problem. Yes. I do think there's an interesting question about whether more kids have ADHD. Mm -hmm. and I, I think that's possible that more kids do. And that's a, uh, it's, it's hard to, to know exactly because there's some kids that really do uh, mm -hmm. have a brain-based uh, disorder where they have tremendous difficulties in attention and, and focus mm -hmm. and, and impulsiveness. And, you know, that might, uh, that might have to do with, with uh, uh, toxins in our environment. Mm -hmm. And it might also have to do with a terrible diet that some of the kids have these days. Um, <clears throat> but there was one study sh that showed that they took cord blood from uh, a lot of babies around the country. And they found that there was an average of over 200 organic chemicals mm -hmm. that were known to cause brain issues. And that's the, that's the blood that's been 
circulating in this baby's brain, their whole gestation. That's what they're bathing in, essentially. Their brain is bathing in. And there's all these neurotoxins. And we just, none of these have been tested for, hardly any of them have been tested for what they can do to our brain. And then, you know, then you have all the other toxins in the environment. We know that high pesticide levels are associated with higher levels of ADHD. Like if you, in a big study of eight-year-olds, those with higher than average pesticide levels had higher than average, eight, had twice the amount actually of ADHD as those under the median. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of reasons that, that maybe more kids actually also do have ADHD. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good point about not only the things in the environment, but even even prenatal exposure and, and the diet piece is big. You know, what what constitutes food now compared to 20, 50, 100 years ago is really very different, isn't it? It is. And there's a, a thing we're learning called epigenetics, which a lot of people don't know about. I mean, we think of our DNA code, our genetics as something that's sort of passed along from generation to generation. And once you have it, it doesn't change. But it's actually the way our genetics express change. And not only that, that, but something that happens to a mom can pass, can not only change her expression of her genetics, but that can be passed to her child. So an interesting idea is, uh, you know, lead we know causes increased ADHD, but lead is actually way lower in our environment now than it used to be because, you know, all the leaded gas and paint is out. But there might have been changes that happened in the people exposed to high levels of lead, like my generation that have been passed on. So it's just a whole other area. Interesting. So many facets to look at in terms of why so many kids are being diagnosed with these issues. So I guess that leads to the question then, you know, the simple solution just, well, we have medications for these things. Um, right. You and I have a bit of a different perspective on this. And so I'd like to hear from you, why not just use medication for all these kids who are having these issues? Well, that's really a good question. Uh, the first question, the first answer is that for many of these kids, the medications don't work very well. But about 70% of them in the short term, it seemed, they seem to work. But they do have a lot of side effects. Uh, but about 30% of kids, they just don't work. I mean, the side effects are too bad for them to even take it or they don't have the, the expected effect. But um, there are some really significant side effects for some kids. Some kids don't have them, but some kids do. And they include simple things like not being able to eat, not, not sleeping well, but also some subtle stuff like personality changes. I've had so many kids who come see me and say, yeah, the, the medication is working, but it's just not himself. She's lost her joy. You know, they're just kids are sort of damped. Not, we're not zombies in that way that a lot of people are, you know, worried about. I would, that's usually an exaggeration unless somebody's not paying attention to proper dosing at all. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they can have side effects. The other part of it is we don't really know what the long term effect of of these ADHD medications, the psychostimulants are. The studies we have so far are not very positive about their long-term efficacy, how, how good they are in the long term. That may be partly because it's really hard to do these studies. You know, you can't take 200 kids and say, okay, you give 100, you give Ritalin to 100 and this other 100, don't give any Ritalin and we'll see you when you're 18, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. Just, you can't ethically do that study. So it's a little tricky, but we don't know that it's actually effective in the long run. And, and there's something called the Cochrane databases, which is sort of the most respected evaluator of whether things work in medicine. You know, they just do research and all the analyses. And they just came out and said that, well, we're not really sure that Ritalin works in the long mm -hmm. run. Um, the other thing we don't know is even if it works, in what way does it change the brain? Mm -hmm. When you take a medicine that affects your neurotransmitters for years and years in a developing child and adolescent, it is going to change the way your brain works. Now, that may be for the positive, it may be for the negative. So the question is, if you're seven and you take ADHD medications until you're 18, do you have more of an ADHD-like brain mm -hmm. or do you have less of an ADHD-like brain? And we just don't know the answer to that question. So for all those reasons, I think we should, number one, be really careful about diagnosis, mm -hmm. only use medications in kids who really need it, and use any, you know, 
effective non-pharmaceutical treatments uh, first or mm -hmm. along with medications. Yeah, I think it's so common, you know, when I see parents at, at my clinic, their experience has been, well, you know, we had a concern or teachers had a concern um, about what was going on with our child, went to, um, you know, the pediatrician or whoever the primary care provider was, had kind of a brief, um, you know, office appointment and left with a prescription. And, right. you know, that unfortunately is, has become sort of standard practice um, around dealing with these things. And what you're talking about is um, a, a different process of really gathering more information, I think. And instead of just having, you know, a 10 minute office visit and saying, well, you know, let's see if a prescription helps. What you're talking about is really needing to delve into more of the issues surrounding why the kid's having problems in the first place. Absolutely, I agree, and I'm glad you brought that up because that's another reason for the overdiagnosis of ADHD is misdiagnosis. Because kids who are diagnosed with ADHD can have a lot of problems uh, that mass that look like ADHD but are not, like learning disabilities, mm -hmm. like sleep apnea, like anxiety. Anxiety can easily be diagnosed, but well, you can't really tell that in a 10 or 15 minute visit. Mm -hmm. Really, you know, it takes a couple of hours, really. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, the absolute optimal would be a multi a multidisciplinary uh, evaluation where there was a doctor and a psychologist and maybe somebody who visited the school. I mean, that's that's hard. Yeah. Uh, and, and even I can't have that arranged here, but <laughs> at least you can take the time to find out and, you know, get feedback from teachers. A lot of times, you know, the pediatricians or family medicine doctors will get feedback, but it's just in the form of this, this standardized questionnaire, which is really not enough. It's just not enough. So that's really important. And I think that's important for parents to understand that there can be so many issues that can present like inattention or, you know, impulsivity or the kinds of symptoms that we see with ADD or ADHD, but really the underlying issues are different. Maybe it's anxiety or trauma or learning disabilities or whatever. And in those cases, when we just rush to medication for what we're calling ADHD, sometimes we can actually make the problem worse. But, you know, typically then kids are still struggling and it's because we're not really targeting what the real issues are for them. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. You really have to make sure you've got the right diagnosis, which takes time. Yeah. And it's it's really hard to blame the pediatricians because, you know, they're working in these environments where they don't have the extra time to spend. And um, there's not enough developmental pediatricians and child psychiatrists to even go around or don't. Yeah. Although even some of those uh, child psychiatrists don't take the time either. I had a mom come into my office and said that she went to her child psychiatrist and he asked the kid to wait outside, which is, you know, that's normal while she he talked to the mom. And she started talking, and in 10 minutes, he said, well, your child has ADHD and got out his prescription pad. Mm -hmm. And yeah. she was, like, stunned. And she said, well, no thanks. And right. He had not actually ever even spoken to the child. Mm -hmm. yep. So this is, you know, you just can't do medicine like that. Right. So let's get into, then, um, what are some of the non pharmaceutical alternatives, because I really want parents to, um, you know, get some ideas around, well, what else could I look at? What else might be helpful for my child who's having some of these issues? Okay, so the first one is nutrition, and nutrition in two ways. One is just having a healthy diet without food additives. We know artificial colors and flavors uh, make kids more hyperactive, even normal kids. In Europe, there if you put artificial certain artificial colors in the food, they actually put a warning label on it and says this may make your kid more hyperactive. For instance, Kraft macaroni and cheese, the yellow here is artificial. In Europe, they changed it to a natural flavor because nobody would buy it. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing, a simple thing, avoiding too much sugar, uh, avoiding artificial uh, sweeteners, which we know can have neurological consequences. Um, and then uh, not having too many processed carbs, especially at breakfast. And one of my slides says, when did Pop-Tarts become breakfast, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So if you get, what happens with, artif with uh, really highly processed carbohydrates is when you eat them, they turn into sugar in your body very quickly. And then your blood sugar level goes high, 
And then it goes, your body doesn't like that, so your blood sugar level drops too low, and then you can be irritable and not paying attention and look like you have ADHD, or it could make your ADHD symptoms worse. Mm -hmm. So you want to avoid that. Like One of the worst breakfasts you can give, which is really common, is waffles with mm -hmm. syrup. Mm -hmm. I mean, waffles are just highly beaten white flour, and then you add, which turns into sugar, then you add sugar, you might as well just pour a whole funnel full of sugar down your child's throat and let them go off to school, right? right? So yeah. talk about this, you know, so you want to have a good amount of protein, some fat, which slows sugar digestion, maybe a carb, you know, mm -hmm. there's lots of good stuff out there, oatmeal, uh, eggs, uh, um, peanut butter on a good whole wheat toast with a glass of milk if you're not sensitive to milk, all that kind of stuff. So really watching the diet is another is one thing. And then there's a proportion of kids with ADHD who actually have a sensitivity to some food that makes them hyper. Gluten and dairy are the most common ones. Now, I don't want to make the point, try and make the point that this is like all kids with ADHD. Right. To, in my practice, it's probably less than half. Mm -hmm. But the ones right. that are sensitive, it can be really dramatic how much better they get mm -hmm. when they take these foods out of their diet. And so I often, with the hyperactive kids, uh, will ask them to do an elimination diet and try and figure out if any particular foods are uh, interfering uh, with their behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see that same thing. Of it, you know, it certainly isn't um, the majority of kids with these issues, but you know, there's a substantial minority where when we remove one or more, um, you know, types of foods, they it makes a big difference. And typically, what I find with the kids with more of the hyperactive, impulsive, like more outward behavioral kinds of things, you can notice a difference pretty quickly if there's a food that's that's bothering them. Um, and sometimes parents will say, "Oh." You know, it's so hard to do that. And, you know, and, and it can be challenging. And as a parent who's had to do that myself, I certainly get that. But, you know, I, I help people think about how much time and energy and emotion are you investing in dealing with, you know, the things that you're dealing with with your child. Might it be easier to, you know, if there is a food that's creating a problem, um, you know, to be able to address that because it just makes everybody's life easier. No, I totally agree. I, uh, it, is, it can be difficult. I think it depends on where you live. And here in San Francisco, it's not that hard <laughs> to get gluten-free anything. Right, right. Imagine if you lived in Oklahoma or Mississippi or somewhere, it might be a little more right, difficult. Right. I don't know about Michigan. <laughs> yeah, it, we're, we're getting, you know, the Midwest always uh, is the last to get everything. So certainly you have a lot more options there on the West Coast, but we're starting to become, you know, unfortunately, I mean, we're talking about sky, skyrocketing rates of like ADHD and those kinds of things. I mean, just the rates of chronic illness in general <laughs> have gone up and there's so many more people now who are requiring gluten-free diets, you know, those types of things that I think it, it is starting to become more the norm that, that those things are more widely available, certainly more widely available than they were five or 10 years ago. That's for sure. Right, right. I, you know, I, th I, and it's, I agree with you that it's the hyperactive impulsive kids who seem to respond best. The kids who have the kind of purely inattention type mm -hmm. of ADHD, I don't find respond as uh, often to uh, some kind of elimination diet. Yeah, I, I would and agree then, with that. Going on with nutrition, there's nutritional supplements, which can be really helpful. So fish oil has been highly studied in ADHD, and I recommend that every child in my practice get fish oil. Mm -hmm. I usually, you have to look very carefully at which one you buy, though. Uh, uh, I talk about it in my book and you know give details, but basically you want to check how much EPA and DHA the product has, and it should be about 1,000 for smaller kids, 2,000 for adolescents, and 1,500 in between, with more EPA than DHA. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a, really, that's a really solid, easy thing to do. And then we know that lower levels of iron or zinc can affect ADHD. So I always check a blood test, and even vitamin D, although there's less information about that. Mm -hmm. So I always check these kids for iron, zinc, and vitamin D. And by iron, I mean I measure something called ferritin, not just mm -hmm. the blood count because that's the one that's associated with ADHD. And a real lot of kids are either deficient or just really on the very lower end. And if you give them iron, it can really be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with zinc, same thing with vitamin D. So those are some really simple things you can do in the nutrition world. Mm -hmm. 
And are those, um, you know, just for parents listening, are those reasonable things for them to ask their child's pediatrician or primary care physician, you know, if they've discussed with them concerns about these symptoms? I know sometimes parents feel a little bit uneasy or unsure about talking about some of these things with their child's, you know, healthcare providers. Would you say, would you encourage parents that that's a reasonable thing to ask for or to discuss as some of those specific nutrient labs? I think it is. And I, I my experience is that um, most people's pediatricians will do that for them, whether yeah. they, you know, believe in this kind of approach or not, because it's a simple blood test. <clears throat> it's not particularly expensive. Mm -hmm. It's one blood draw. Um, and what I tell them is if their pediatrician won't even do that, it might be time to find somebody who's a little more uh, negotiable and amenable to what, where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's the same recommendation that I give to people as well, because it should be a collaboration. Um, and, you know, if parents are feeling like their healthcare provider is not open to collaborating or talking about options, then, yeah, there are other providers. And my experience is that the vast majority of um, uh, physicians or healthcare providers who are seeing the kids that we treat here at my clinic are very open to um, looking at, they, they may not initiate it, they, they may not, you know, have the same knowledge level that you do about, you know, the types of nutrients that they should test for, but once that's brought up to them, they're very open to looking at that and actually interested in learning more, um, you know, about how those can be factors. I agree. And actually, most of the pediatricians I talk to, I give lectures on this a lot, you know, grand rounds, and they're very interested. In, and most pediatricians aren't that happy about all the psychostimulants like Ritalin they're, they're having to give out. They're not comfortable with it. They don't think it's a great thing that 15% of the, you know, of the kids in some of their places uh, are uh, taking these medications, but they're kind of caught in a bind. So, yeah, they like to be able to do this, most of them. Yeah, awesome. So we've got nutrition. You talked about um, food and ways that we can look at that. You've talked about some specific nutrients and supplements. What, what else? What are some other things that parents can be thinking about? Well, here's some really simple stuff. There's just simple lifestyle things like, are they getting enough sleep? <laughs> Most, many kids are not getting enough sleep, especially as you get into the older years. I mean, we have these enormous homework loads and kids are expected to do all this extracurricular activities. And so a lot of them are simply tired. Mm -hmm. And uh, just getting, I have many people in my practice who say when their kids get enough sleep, this just makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and also not making sure they don't have sleep apnea. If they're snoring, that can make a big difference. So they're not getting quality sleep. And um, downtime, uh, just, you know, some of these kids are just so stressed. There's never a second when they're not doing something. You know, it, it, like I said before, you know, it's like school and then after school activities and then a quick supper and then having to do their homework. And then all, and then you start throwing violin lessons and, and <laughs> And some of them are getting tutori, you know, tutoring, and, and mm -hmm. it can just stress them out. And then a big one is exercise. We know now that exercise is really beneficial for the brain, and especially for ADHD kids. And so many schools have cut PE to once or twice a week. And um, these kids are not, they should be out getting exercise every day. Mm -hmm. And that can make a really big difference. Yeah, uh, and even there's a, there's some research indicating being in nature, not just mm -hmm. exercise, but actually being in nature is beneficial for kids with ADHD. So just a lot of these kind of lifestyle changes can be very helpful. Yeah, I agree. I've seen the same, and you know, I, I think um, another component to this when we talk about things like. Um, you know, having uh, downtime, getting good sleep, getting exercise or movement, and is looking at the role that electronic devices and digital media uh, yes. that because I think that's a huge thing that we're dealing with with kids now that wasn't a factor 20, 40, 50 years ago. Oh, yeah. Maybe even 10 years ago. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, electronics is a major issue. Um, it doesn't seem reasonable now for most kids to just totally ban electronics. Right. Uh, but I always talk to parents about having some kind of limit on electronics, especially during the week, maybe 30 minutes, mm -hmm. something like that, maybe an hour. It just depends on the family. And um, yeah, and not only does it keep them from doing some kind of other thing they could be doing, 
but I think there's a there's a kind of a quality to it that for some kids with ADHD makes them worse. Mm -hmm. I do have parents who tell me if their kid gets on electronics for five minutes in the morning, a day yeah. done. Yeah, yeah uh, not you know, not most kids aren't like that, yeah. but it can be really a problem. Um, and I think we have to look at it individually, but as a general rule, parents have to be on top of it. And sometimes mm -hmm. that means they actually literally have to like take the mm -hmm. take the phones away, take the, the, the stuff away when they go to sleep. Um, mm -hmm. You know, turn a you know, unplug the computer. <laughs> Take it into the, the plug into their room because kids will literally get up at you know, the age of nine or ten yep. in the middle of the night and sleep down and uh, sneak down and play video games. Mm -hmm. And parents, you know, realize that they've been doing this, and of course, their performance is not as good. Right. Yeah. And I, I think it's one of the things I see clinically that's been a driving force behind why so many preteens and teenagers. Now, who really, when you do a thorough analysis of their developmental history, didn't have problems with ADD or ADHD symptoms, or at least not severe ones when they were younger, but now as they've gotten into adolescence are having way more problems. And, and what I see is lack of sleep due to having you know smartphones and other devices in their bedroom at night. And so some of these kids are admitting to me when their parents are out of the room that, well, I may be sleep three, four, five hours a night because I'm texting oh with friends, God. I'm on social media, the notifications are going off all night long. Um, you know, and I, just the impact that that has on the brain and a kid who maybe didn't have those issues before, their brain starts to function less optimally or kids who maybe were prone to some of those challenges, they can look way worse when, you know, a 12-year-old or a 16-year-old isn't getting a decent amount of sleep at night. Absolutely. It's, it's a really, really big problem. You know, that you bring up a good point. It used to be that you shouldn't diagnose ADHD if symptoms didn't occur before seven. Yep. And then they changed to 12, which is you know, probably reasonable. So you're seeing a lot of these kids now, and you know, they've come up, they come in at 13 or 14 or 12 or something. It's all, all of a sudden they can't pay attention in class, mm -hmm. they're not getting good grades. You should be very suspicious that something is going on besides ADHD. Mm -hmm. you know, occasionally it's because you know, the challenge has just gotten high enough to, to be you know, cause and effect. But, a lot of times there's something else going on, whether it be uh, pressure of the school they're in. And, you know, in San Francisco, you have to start doing interviews to even get into kindergarten. And, <laughs> and <laughs> high school, getting into high school is like trying to get into Harvard around here. Right. It's just right. insane. So like those kind of pressures build up. Mm -hmm. The other thing I wanted to mention, though, is parenting. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of kids with ADHD are really difficult to parent. What happens is they're, they're told no all the time. They're, they're criticized all the time in school and at home. Why didn't you do this? Sit still, be quiet. Why didn't you finish your homework? No, 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 no. So they start, and a lot of them are oppositional anyway. And so there starts to be this really negative kind of uh, uh, feedback cycle where, where they just start, because the only attention they get is negative, they just start seeking negative attention and acting out. And you have, and parents can be really flummoxed. You know that the same parenting that worked very well for their other child or for their neighbor's child isn't working. And often you'll see them either getting super angry at the kids or letting them get away with murder. Mm -hmm. Either one. Yeah. And this this is a really difficult cycle. So I'm sure you do this in your practice, but you really help people. You really need to. Uh, help people with their parenting. There's a lot of approaches. I like something called the nurtured heart approach, mm -hmm. yep. which I've given to hundreds of families and I find it very, very effective. Mm -hmm. um, but there are others. And but I think you really have to look into it, see how it's going, and often giving parents um, an approach. This is the way you do it. This is what you can do, along with often some people, from some help with somebody in the mental health field can make a dramatic difference. And it should be part of it. For everybody. Absolutely. And uh, the research is bearing that out more and more, the um, huge impact that parent-child interaction has on symptom development and progression over time, and also the, the benefits of um, using parent-focused treatments as a first-line intervention for these things. Right. Uh, and I think it's important for parents to hear clearly that what we're saying here is not that parents or the way that they're parenting are causing their kids to have problems. That's not what we're saying. What we are saying is that when kids have these struggles, 
the strategies that we use as parents, the way that we approach our relationship and parenting them can make a big difference in supporting their symptoms. Absolutely. I totally agree. This is not because people are bad parents. It's because right. these are hard right. to parent. Yeah. And one thing about all these non-pharmaceutical approaches I want to emphasize is I do use medication in my practice. Mm -hmm. Some kids need medication, mm -hmm. but you should still do these things anyway. Okay. I mean, just because you're giving medication doesn't mean you can suddenly start feeding your child poor food or stop worrying about, you know, parenting things because that's, um, it's all helpful. It's all part of an integrative or a holistic treatment is to look at all aspects, even whether you're taking medication or not. That's a great point because I, you know, there have been some studies too showing that when we implement some of these other approaches and strategies that you and I are talking about, even for kids who are, are on medication, it can help the medications work better. It helps them make more progress than they would if they were just taking medications um, by themselves. Oh yeah, there's actually one really interesting study about an herb called ginkgo, which uh, has been used for centuries for cognitive effects. And they gave kids who were already taking Ritalin, either ginkgo or a placebo. And after a certain amount of time, the kids who were getting the ginkgo had improvements in attention that didn't happen in the kids who were getting mm. placebo. So it added to the efficacy of mm. the Ritalin. Yeah, fascinating. There's so many more things we could talk about with this. It's such, a, um, such an interesting and such an important topic. We are running low on time, and so I want to make sure that um, people know where they can um, find out more about you, where they can get your uh, awesome book, ADHD Without Drugs. If we can share that with our listeners, that would be great. Oh, yeah. So they can get that book on Amazon. It's really easy. And uh, also, you know, if they Google it, my videos are uh, online and, you know, they can look at them. Yeah, some wonderful videos. I encourage everybody to check those out and definitely um, get the book, ADHD Without Drugs. Like I said, um, a book that I have referred back to often and that so many families in my practice have found beneficial. So Dr. Newmark, thank you so much for being here today and sharing your expertise and experience with us. Uh, it's my pleasure. It was really fun talking to you. Okay, everybody, that's it for this episode. We will see you next time on The Better Behavior Show.